Hi everyone, my name is Whitney Bowsman, and I am the author of the book Partly Sunny, an honest and humorous look at the first weeks of bringing home a newborn. This week we are going to talk about a really weird phenomenon that occurs with a lot of new moms. But before we jump in, I just wanted to say that if this is your first time here, my hope is that you will pop back in the Partly Sunny playlist and start with us from the very beginning so that you can get caught up. And for those of you who have been here since the beginning, I cannot believe that we are nearing the finish line on reading Partly Sunny together. And I am really excited for today's chapter, which is Chapter 7, Evil Evenings. Things can be scary when they are new and different. Things can be boatloads scarier when they are new and different and unpredictable. To the dismay of every type A personality out there, like myself, newborns are about as far from predictable as a thing can get. Be it 2 a.m. or 2 p.m., those first long, delirious days, and you've got yourself a crapshoot of what-ifs and what sometimes seriously feels like survival of the fittest. Babies are demanding without schedule, without warning, and without provocation, both day and night and everywhere in between. Even with a cup of highly caffeinated coffee on board and in circulation, a few hours of sleep on the internal register, and the good vibes of the sun's rays beaming through opened curtains and window panes, daytime hours with a newborn on their own can be draining and overwhelming. The overnight hours, though, oh man, they're just extra rough. Babies' overnight needs have a way of feeling super overwhelming, super, super fast. Is it just me, or have you ever noticed that nighttime in general makes everything worse? Pretend, for example, that you've got a job interview tomorrow. Now, to bedazzle things a bit, let's say you're a techie nerd like my hubby, and this is the job of jobs. Your dream job. Think along the lines of, like, Apple or Google or something. Something big time that you've spent lots of time preparing and researching for. You go over some possible interview scenarios in your head throughout the day, you use your commute for talking yourself through a run-through, and you even have someone you love serve as a makeshift interviewer to grill you with questions over dinner. You're antsy and nervous, but it's in a good way, and it's nothing you can't handle. Until evening approaches, that is. As the sun says adios and bids another day farewell, your good nerves go bad. Butterflies in the belly turn to unease, which turns to true anxiety, doubt, and fear. Suddenly, you question whether or not you should even show up for the interview. You wonder whether or not you have what it takes. You fear you're going to make yourself look like a total idiot in a room full of Steve Jobses. And your mind races and races and races. For whatever reason, life's stresses have a way of being exaggerated and emblazoned in our minds under the cover of darkness. Just recently, this phenomenon was in full effect for me as I laid awake one evening worrying about my kids. As a mom, this happens kind of a lot. It's just a part of who I am. Going out for a few hours is one thing, but being away from Clark and Annie overnight is a whole different concept. It requires a lot of planning, and doesn't exactly require, but always includes, fretting. Jonathan and I do make a point of taking a good bit of couple time, and even alone time for ourselves, as we fully recognize that it makes us better parents, spouses, and people in general. Being away from the kids overnight, though, as I write this, Annie is just shy of 20 months old and Clark is approaching three and a half. I can count on one hand the number of times that I've slept away from them. A few weeks ago, however, Jonathan and I were slated to go away for an entire weekend with our friends Brian and Kelly. Our plans were to travel about two hours north and stay in my father-in-law's Creekside Cottage. Formally christened Lazy Acres and informally just The Cottage, this cozy little abode has sort of become a home away from home for Jonathan and I since we got married almost nine years ago. We figured that if we were going to be brave and get away for more than one night, the cottage was the place to give it a go. In the days leading up to our getaway, I was busy taking care of the kids, writing up instructions and suggested schedules, prepping meals, and everything else that overbearing mothers do. I was stressed, don't get me wrong, 
but I simply didn't have a ton of time to sit around and stress. The nights though, ugh. As soon as my head hit the pillow, my brain was bombarded with anxious thoughts. Thoughts like, what if one of the kids gets sick or hurt? What if it snows and Jonathan and I get stuck away from the house? What if Clark can't fall asleep because his OCD bedtime routine is disrupted? What if the kids are just awful jerky toddlers the whole time we're gone? The worries kept piling one on top of the other into a heap of ugly that seemed daunting until morning came. After I finally got some rest and daylight shone on the situation, I felt more at ease. When evening returned again as our getaway approached, however, so did the yuck. In the realm between dusk and nighttime, it seems, my mind has a way of blowing small things way out of proportion. Thankfully, this only happens on occasion and is typically something I only deal with at times of high stress. After my kiddos were born though, this sometimes occurring surge of worry became an always occurring tidal wave of uncertainty to the nth degree. I lovingly refer to this concept as the evil evening. As best I can describe it, the evil evening is like a Pandora's box of nonsense. Anxiety, fatigue, stress, worry, and anticipation that magically opens when the sun sets on a hormonally wrecked new mom. It looks and feels a lot like a switch that can take you from a state of feeling accomplished, a tad bit put together, and okay, I got this, to experiencing a sense of impending doom for what another long sleepless night may hold, and crap, I totally don't got this. After I had Clark, I remember telling my mom that evenings for some reason felt really scary. I could experience as good of a day as was possible with a newborn, start to feel like I was finally getting the swing of being a new mom to the point of actually enjoying it, and then 5 p.m. would roll around and all of these gross emotions would start setting in. Harry Potter groupie like me? If so, picture the Dementors and the way that they were depicted in the film series. Things could be totally okay in the land of mom, evening would hit, and out of nowhere, a Dementor would eerily creep up on me only to steal my joy and leave fear in its wake. My evil evenings may not have been quite as dramatic as the masterful dark creatures of JK Rowling, but they for sure felt real and could completely upend any remote feelings of control that I was just starting to grasp as a new mom. Sometimes these weird evil evenings would put me in unexplainable, almost ridiculous tears. The time I sat down with Jonathan for dinner only to burst into hysterics for no good reason at all? The evil evening at work. Other times, the evil evening would just give me knots in my stomach. I can remember a few occasions, for example, when I had been badly looking forward to Jonathan's return from work and a chance to reconnect over a good meal, only to find that the approach of dusk and the arrival of the evil evening had robbed me of an appetite. At a couple of points in time, the evil evening even brought me to random outbursts of gut-wrenching laughter, which may have resulted in my less hormonal husband questioning the status of my sanity. You know what, though? I might have looked pretty crazy laughing at next to nothing, but I celebrated the evenings that ended in laughter instead of tears for a change. The evil evening had landed me in a weird place as a new parent. In this place, my emotions were totally and completely labile, especially in the post-afternoon hours. When I shared with my mom that I was experiencing this silly, almost phobia of dusk in the nighttime that followed it, she was quick to tell me that I wasn't alone. Even though nearly 28 years had passed since bringing her youngest daughter into the world, she could vividly remember having the same feelings. In the early days of motherhood, my mom shared that as the sun went down, her level of anxiety went up. Mom dreaded those long, lonely newborn nights, and she very much welcomed the rising of the sun every morning. The evil evening was a real thing for her, too. Before I sat down to start writing this chapter, I knew that at least my mom and I had a rocky relationship with the evening hours as new parents. I remembered a funny story that suggested to me it may be a more universal experience. When Jonathan and I participated in childbirth classes before the arrival of Clark, 
the instructor shared with us a candid memory of her own newborn days. While, like me, she never dealt with true diagnosed postpartum depression and was quick to point new moms toward medical help if they ever felt hopeless or lacked a sense of connection with their baby, she did recall crying lots in the days and especially evenings following the births of her children. Our instructor shared that once, as dusk fell, she happened to be looking at her curtains. Yes, her curtains. And without warning or explanation, tears began to fall from her cheeks. When her husband looked at her, bewildered and concerned, to ask what was the matter, she turned to him and laugh-cried while explaining that her curtains just weren't the right color. Stinking evil evening. As I prepared for this project and attempted to gauge the newborn experience for moms and dads across the board, I came upon many a discussion page and article where things like weepy evenings and nighttime anxiety were brought up. The case of evil evenings, it seems, goes well beyond just myself, my mom, and my childbirth instructor. In all actuality, lots and lots of new parents encounter some version of it. I have a couple of very loosely defined theories on why perhaps this phenomenon occurs as and when it does. For starters, there are simply less distractions when it comes to the evening and nighttime hours. During the day, especially when you are the sole provider for your wee one if your support person has returned to work, there are just lots of things to try to accomplish. You've got to feed your cherub, snag some snuggle time, feed yourself, and attempt to check off maybe one or two of the items on your list of like 45 that could be beneficial in keeping your household standing for another day. There's just so much to do when the sun is shining. As the sun fades, however, and the day winds down, well, there's less to keep a mind occupied. When the body is busy, the brain is distracted and focused on the task at hand. When the body slows down or attempts to rest, though, the brain is free to worry and stress and anticipate. This is true for everyone, I think, but it is especially true for new parents because of the added stressors of sleep deprivation and adaptation to a life with a newborn. For postpartum moms in particular, it's especially, especially true because of the added wonder of hormones. These special blessed hormones have a way of making a new mom look and feel like a loon at any time of the day, really. But the evenings? Well, hormones are just mean, spiteful little buggers that exaggerate baseline anxieties and prevent any semblance of rest when the day comes to a close. Then, when you've been home alone all day with a little one who doesn't really interact and can't hold a conversation with you, there's a sense of relief and release when your other returns to you, which most often occurs in the evening. If I'm being honest, Jonathan getting home from work those first weeks after Clark joined our family was a little weird. I anticipated his arrival so much and for so long during the day, and then he would show up and suddenly I'd feel like a basket case who was constantly on the verge of tears. For me, my husband is just my person, if you know what I mean. If I'm going to let myself be vulnerable and truly seen to anyone, it's Jonathan. He's my rock, and he supports me and my dreams without ceasing. Because being a new mom was so hard and so different and so velchmerzy, especially during the solo daytime hours, I sort of had a tendency to dump a day's worth of thoughts frustrations, and happenings on my man not long after he walked back through the door. It was like my emotions were carbonated and capped tightly in a glass bottle all day long while it was just me and my unable-to-chat babe. As soon as my hubby came back to me, however, and I had someone to converse and commiserate with, that cap was cracked, my feelings were free, and out they erupted. Whether I wanted them to or not. Finally, and what may be the most obvious explanation for the evil evening, is the reality that it affects baby, too. All of the parents out there already know this to be true, but babies are often fussiest in the evening hours. Be it true colic or general crankiness, lots of newborns cry most during the evening. 
right around the time you and your man are longing to reconnect and enjoy a nice quiet, haha, dinner after being apart for the whole day. Some folks even refer to this time of the day as the witching hours. Well, when your newborn is crying and crying and crying despite your best attempts at isolating reasons why, it isn't that surprising that a new mom may also start to feel anxious, overwhelmed, and just a bit gloomy herself. Jonathan may not have delivered Clark and may not have had a body ravaged by postnatal hormones, but even he, I would say, was hit by the evil evening one occasion. I can remember one specific evening a few weeks into parenting when we had a very fussy, almost hostile little Clark on our hands. I was vacuuming not because my floors needed to be clean, but because my brain couldn't process the sound of crying any longer without a breakdown. Jonathan was bouncing Clark on his shoulder for what seemed like hours, and I'll never forget him looking at his tiny little son with tears in his own eyes. Frustration and helplessness were painted all over his face when he looked at Clark and said, What do you need, buddy? Why can't I help you? It broke my heart, and obviously his as well. Whatever may be the source of this strange happening, it is super real to many new parents. All of the medical folks out there, my fellow nurses in particular, will appreciate that I liken this phenomenon to sundowning. If you aren't familiar with the concept of sundowning, it's a stark change in a person's behavior that usually occurs as the day is transitioning into the night. Sundowning most often affects those with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia, but I even saw it as a floor nurse in patients with no prior history just because of the stress associated with a hospital stay. Picture Joe Schmo, whose daytime self is the sweetest, gentlest, meekest elderly gentleman you've ever laid eyes on, having an almost Hulk-like experience as the sun sets. The new Joe? Angry, violent, and stronger than even looks possible for his delicate frame. Every nurse has a good sundowning story in their back pocket. For me, I don't even need to look beyond the mirror because my evil evenings gave me plenty of personal examples. I remember the evil evening hitting me like a ton of bricks on one particular occasion when I bit off a little more than I could chew too soon after Annie's delivery. Annie was born just nine days before my family's annual Memorial Day bash. Every year, this event is hosted by my brother-in-law's wonderful dad and stepmom, John and Kendra, who are like another set of grandparents to our kids. It's always a time of games and crafts for the tots, much needed conversation and laughter amongst the adults, and good food and drink for all. We may have been beyond tired and still adjusting to our life as a family of four, but Jonathan and I made the decision to go. For our sakes, Jonathan and I really needed to get out of the house and escape the monotony of the newborn routine. For Clark's sake, he was needing a little attention and time with his cousins as his entire world had been turned upside down. All in all, we had a great time, and even though my mom and sisters thought I was a little nuts and were pretty surprised by my appearance, we made the right choice in going. Clark was busy, busy, busy and kept us on our toes, but he behaved about as well as he could for being an always moving toddler. Besides her typical latching struggles, Annie didn't make much of a fuss and slept basically the entire time. Sounds like a win, right? Well, even though everything was going as smoothly as can be expected with two unpredictable, tiny little humans, in a matter of seconds, I went from being collected to an internal wreck. The evil evening was upon me heavy. I glanced at Jonathan, caught his attention, and my panicked eyes must have said it all because he knew we needed to start packing up immediately. I muttered something along the lines of, we gotta go. And in a matter of mere moments, we had collected all of our baby gear and gadgets, properly fastened our mini selves into their car seats, grabbed our to-go plates of cake, and began the hour-long trek home. A few minutes into the trip, Jonathan gave me a, you okay? And the waterworks started. I probably cried for a solid half of that trip home for no identifiable reason, only to laugh the other half of the trip at my nonsense. All I can say is that I've got some pretty darned good loved ones who support me, crazy and all, because none of this fazed them in the least. They were all just happy that my crew made an appearance in any form, albeit short, 
and were much obliged to let us escape whenever necessary. Because having no routine, no schedule, and no predictability took me so far beyond the comforts of my element and my norm those first days with newborns, I knew that I needed not only the support of my family, friends, and Jonathan, but some divine intervention as well. If spirituality or faith isn't a part of your life or your community, please know that you are both respected and welcomed here. You can still see me and feel me, differences and all. I hope you'll come along as I share, but if you can't or won't, just skip ahead a paragraph or two. I'll meet you for the wrap up. As I briefly mentioned before, prayer is a basic source of strength for me in my day-to-day -day life. It's sort of a calming, centering, focusing thing that has become central to my adult self. Before kids, I used to keep the radio off in the car and use the solace and quiet as a chance to check in above. Since a quiet car ride is non-existent in a world after kids, now I usually pray at length while I'm running. Additionally, I often pray in short, out loud bursts when I'm having a moment and need God to help keep me from being imprisoned. Prayer was such a crutch for me after the births of both of my babies. When I would sense the evil evening in the distance and knew that it was approaching yet again, I often prayed. I prayed for comfort. I prayed for peace. I prayed that it would quickly pass. Most of the time, these prayers were internal and brief, but there were times when I actually asked Jonathan if he minded praying with me or was at least okay with me praying out loud right next to him. Many times as a new mom, the evil evening just nagged at me, bringing with it all kinds of anxiety. Ultimately, however, being in prayer and acknowledging to myself and others that I was having this experience is how I was able to put it in its place and laugh it away instead of becoming overwhelmed or suffocated by it. For lots and lots of reasons, nighttime with a newborn is just scary. When you've got a baby that won't settle and a body that is tired every night, in the beginning anyway, feels long and dark and unsettling. Especially when life before babe was filled with actual rest and rejuvenation. When you just can't predict what the night ahead may bring, it's no surprise that the hours leading up to it can feel a little evil. Fortunately though, the nights do get easier. Hormones do abate. Routines do emerge. And eternal exhaustion does become normal. For me, the evil evening relented its daily pursuit of my control when I was finally able to settle into all of the new normals that life with a newborn threw at me both times around. Inch by inch, as the unpredictable dusk and nighttime hours became something that I was more accustomed to, ready for, and even challenged in a good way by sometimes, I was able to greet the evening with more confidence and assurance in myself and with less fear and fret for what may come. When you take an established home, with established routines and established schedules and toss into the mix a newborn who is anything but established in any way, it's understandable that life, for a period anyway, is topsy-turvy. Topsy-turvy living, guys, especially as the dark, baby-fuss-filled hours of evening approach, can bring on all sorts of uncharacteristic, evil evening outbursts. In time, however, glimpses of predictability and schedule will spring forth like tiny tendrils of green erupting from the soil after a long winter. When they do, and when the evil evening fades away, I promise that you'll have lots of memories and stories worth laughing at for years and years to come. And with that, chapter seven of our read-along has come to a close. As always, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate your time. I hope that my honesty and my humor is meeting you right where you are at. And I cannot wait to see you back very soon for chapter eight.